Greetings in the Lord. A warm welcome to all of you gathered here today and those joining us online. What a joy it is to worship our Savior God together. Lord's blessings on your worship. We'll begin with our opening hymn. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. that we worship our faithful God with cleansed minds and hearts, let us join in a time for silent prayer and confession. Faithful Father, Hear your children pray. Forgive us for the many times and many ways we have broken your commands, by what we have done and by what we have failed to do. We have sinned against you and against one another in thought, word, and deed. By the mercy you show us in the cross of your dear Son, cleanse our hearts and minds of our guilt and shame. Grant that we holding to the promises of our risen Savior, live with confidence in the grace that draws us into your holy presence. In the name of our Savior, we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we have gathered in the Lord's name and in his house so that we share in all the blessings of life and salvation Jesus freely gives to all who repent of their sin and trust in him. Upon this, your confession, I, as a called servant of the Lord, announce his grace to all of you, and in the stead and by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, forgive you all your sins, 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us respond with our hymn of praise. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, whose grace always precedes and follows us, help us to forsake all trust in earthly gain and to find in you our heavenly treasure. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first lesson is taken from the Old Testament book of Amos, chapter 5. This will also be the basis for our meditation this morning. We read, Seek the Lord and live, or he will sweep through the tribes of Joseph like a fire, and it will devour them, and Bethel will have no one to quench it. There are those who turn justice into bitterness and cast righteousness to the ground. There are those who hate the one who upholds justice in court and detest the one who tells the truth. You levy a straw tax on the poor and impose a tax on their grain. Therefore, though you have built stone mansions, you will not live in them. Though you have planted lush vineyards, you will not drink their wine. For I know how many are your offenses and how great your sins. There are those who oppress the innocent and take bribes and deprive the poor of justice in the courts. Therefore, the prudent keep quiet at such times, for the times are evil. Seek good, not evil, that you may live. Then the Lord Almighty will be with you, just as you say he is. Hate evil, love good, maintain justice in the courts. Perhaps the Lord Almighty will have mercy on the remnant of Joseph. This is the word of the Lord. We'll respond with our psalm of the day, which is also hymn 441.
Our second lesson comes from the epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 13. We read, Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison, and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Keep your lives free from the love of money, and be content with what you have, because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? This is the word of the Lord. We'll continue with the verse of the day. Please stand in honor of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 10. Glory. Glory be to you, O Lord. We read, As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Please be seated. We'll continue with our hymn of the day.
Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord, our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Dear people of God, our gospel today has a pretty shocking story. A young man appears, a, a good man, a man who has kept God's commandments from when he was young, from the time that he was a boy, the kind of guy you'd like to be around, the kind of guy we'd like to have in our church, a person that you could trust. And Jesus throws the book at him. Jesus said to you, to, says to him, okay, you've kept the commands. There's one more thing, one more thing for you to do. Go sell everything you have and give the money to the poor. Mark says that Jesus said this because he loved the man. The man needed to have something pointed out to him. That despite all of the good things he had been doing in his life, there was still one thing that he loved more than he loved God, and that was his wealth. And this sin is something he needed to repent of, because otherwise this sin would cause him to lose out on eternal life. In our Old Testament lesson, our first lesson today from the prophet Amos, the nation of Israel was prospering. Everything was going great for the whole nation, and they thought that that must mean that they were doing everything right. And then the Lord sent the prophet Amos to throw the book at them, to point out in very specific terms how they were violating God's commands, how they needed to repent of their sins so that they did not lose out on salvation. We are sinful people too. As sinful as that wealthy young man, as sinful as those Old Testament Israelites. And God loves us also, which, he lead, which is why he leads us to confess our sins. He tells us we need to turn back to him. And the great news is that we can do that in full confidence because we know that our Lord loves us. We know that God is gracious and compassionate that he forgives all of our sins and wipes away all of our guilt. We can follow Amos' invitation here and seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and live. Now our lesson is from around the year 750 B.C. At this time, God's people were actually in two kingdoms, in Judah, the southern kingdom, and the northern kingdom called Israel. And Amos was a prophet to that northern kingdom. At a time when everything was going great, they were prospering. The, the king, King Jeroboam II, had extended the borders way up to the north into Syria and even way down to the south toward the Dead Sea. They were having all sorts of wealth pass through their land as travelers came by and all the trading that they were doing. And they thought that everything was going great. And God was about to overturn their lives. Amos said, Seek the Lord and live. Or he will sweep through the tribes of Joseph like a fire. It will devour them, and Bethel will have no one to quench it. You've seen footage of wildfires burning out of control with nothing. Sometimes it might be almost to stop them. They'll just keep burning, burning up forests, burning up homes, burning up towns, unless there's a big rainfall that finally brings it all to an end. This is Amos' picture for God's anger against sin that it would burn through their land, destroying all things there with nothing that could stop it. Amos talks about Bethel, which was a city where they gathered together. It was a historic city. This is where their ancestor Jacob had had that vision of angels of God ascending and descending up to the throne of the Lord God. Well, the northern kingdom had taken this holy city and built a golden calf, telling people to worship there. They said they were worshiping the Lord God, but they weren't doing it according to God's commands at all. Amos made it clear their false worship was going to do them absolutely no good because the Lord God is the one who, who needs to be worshipped. The Lord is the one who's in control. He made the earth. He made the sky. He controls the weather. He controls all around, everything around us. We like to think that we're in control. And then the worldwide pandemic comes and teaches us just how weak and dependent mankind is. God allows troubles like that in our lives to lead us to cry out to him, to depend upon him instead of trusting in ourselves, and to recognize that we are sins, to repent, to seek him and live. That means 
that we have to admit our sin. Amos, as God's prophet, detailed the specific sins of the people of his day in different chapters. In this chapter, he especially focuses about how, on how justice was not being upheld. In fact, he said, there are those who hate the one who upholds justice in court and detest the one who tells the truth. Amos says they especially exploited the poor who were helpless. He said, there are those who oppress the innocent and take bribes and deprive the poor of justice in the courts. Amos said the nation had become so evil that it was prudent to just keep your mouth shut so that you didn't get crushed too. The rich and powerful thought that they were getting away with all this, but God was still in charge. Therefore, though you have built stone mansions, you will not live in them. Though you have planted lush vineyards, you will not drink their wine. For I know how many are your offenses and how great your sins. God takes sin seriously because he wants his people to repent. And that's true for us too. We are sinful people. Like the ancient Israelites, we want to get as much as we can. It's natural for us, according to our sinful nature, to break God's law. It's natural for us to exploit others. And it's natural for us to think that we're just going to get away with it. Ever since the fall into sin, when Adam and Eve brought sin in this world, sinful people have been tempted to cheat and to steal. And that's been true throughout history right up to our present day. 35 years ago, there was a best-selling book by a businessman who bragged about how he cheated people. He bragged about how he got away with everything. His whole focus was getting everything for himself, and he bragged about how he lied in order to do it. He talked about how if he had a million-dollar piece of property that he wanted to sell, he'd insist it was worth $2 million so he could get a negotiation and get as much money from it as possible. And he wrote that if somebody would say, okay, you say $2 million, I'll give you $2 million, he would hit himself on the head and say, I should have asked for $3 million. There's a lot of people who think that that's how our country works. They think that you should, in fact, Try to get as much as you possibly can from other people. Hey, if somebody's dumb enough to pay $2 million for a piece of property that's only worth $1 million, well, they're just getting what they deserve. You buy a car without getting it checked out and it doesn't work, well, hey, that's just how the system works. What a complete contrast to how God tells us to lead our lives. God has some very simple directions, you know, as to how we should run our economy. Simple sentences like, you shall not steal. That means you don't try to take other people for everything that you possibly can. He followed that up with, you shall not give false testimony. It is wrong to lie to other people. And he followed that one up with the kicker, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, your neighbor's property. In other words, it's wrong even to have this desire to try to take as much as you can from other people. But this is what sinful people do in our day, back in Amos' day, back all the way to Adam and Eve, who wanted to get as much as they could, even if that meant disobeying God and eating that forbidden fruit. So God, in his love, calls us to repent. He warns us in no uncertain terms, seek the Lord and live, or he will sweep through your life like a fire that will devour you. For I know how many are your offenses and how great are your sins. And yet the same Lord who knows all about our sins says we should seek him. We should come to him, turn to him. And when we do, he will not punish us. Instead, he will save us. Seek the Lord and live. Seek good, not evil, that you may live. Then the Lord God Almighty will be with you. Well, why should we want the holy, righteous God, to be with us, sinful people that we are? How could that be something good that God would actually dare to, to love us with all we've done? Well, it's all because of Jesus. This is why Jesus, God's Son, came to this earth, to live a perfect life in our place. Jesus never exploited other people. Instead, Jesus helped the poor and the downtrodden. The people that other ones, others cheated, he stopped and helped them. He healed them, and he preached to them again and again that God loved them and that they have treasures waiting for them in heaven as God takes the meek and exalts them to rule over the earth. 
Jesus didn't butter up the rich and famous. Instead, he pointed out their sins and called them to repent. The powerful people of his day didn't like to hear that. You know, it's kind of interesting in our lesson. Amos says that with evil all around, the prudent keep quiet in such times. But Jesus didn't keep quiet. He pointed out people's sins because that was his job, to come here and lead people to repent so that they could then be saved. The powerful, though, responded instead by having him arrested, by having him beaten, by having him crucified, put to death. Jesus became the perfect sacrifice in our place. He died for our sins. You see, God does punish sin. He punishes all sins. And that's why he took all of our sins on his own back and paid the price for every one of them when he died upon that cross. This is the God who tells us to seek him, to come to him, to turn to him, to trust in him. The God who would actually die for us. And just as Jesus rose from the dead on Easter, so God says, we too rise We will rise to live forevermore with him in our heavenly home. In Jesus, we are forgiven forever. All of our sins are washed away. Every time that we may have taken advantage of someone, every time we didn't help somebody who was in need, every thought even that was selfish, all of these things have been covered by the blood of Jesus. In holy baptism, Jesus washes all of our sins off of our record and then fills us with his righteousness so that we look righteous to God, can enter his presence forever, and so that we actually are righteous. We actually can do things according to his will on this earth. Amos said, Seek good, not evil, that you may live. Then the Lord God Almighty will be with you. Hate evil, love good, maintain justice in the courts. When we know the truth, when we repent and we trust in God, then we can actually lead selfless lives. We will seek to serve others as a way of thanking our God for saving each of us. Now, just to be clear with my earlier illustration, this doesn't mean that you can't run a business and can't make a profit. In fact, you can. God promises that he will allow you to prosper upon this earth when we don't seek to dis- to. Uh, cheat other people. I remember talking to a Christian businessman about this. He, he described how he went about setting prices. He ran a business where he was giving a service to people, and he just said, this is how I do it. I add up all my costs, and then I add about 15 percent. Covers my time and gives me a little bit of profit to help grow my business. And he said, this is how I think most businesses are run, actually. What a contrast to that book that I described. Of course, the, 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 the percentage might change from one industry to another, but the point is you can be successful. You can serve and work hard and, and even become rich as you seek to serve God upon this earth by serving other people. We don't exploit others. Instead, we seek the good of our fellow man as we serve our God. Amos called Israel to repent. In their case, he wasn't too hopeful. He said, perhaps... The Lord God Almighty will have mercy on the remnant of Joseph. As it turned out, most of the people did not repent of their sins. They continued in their selfish ways, exploiting others, even falling into idolatry. And a few years later, their country would be overrun by the Assyrians. And the people were taken away and deported. But the Lord has promised that when we repent of our sins, he is faithful and just. He forgives us of all of our sins. And we will live. And not just live on this earth. We will live forever in that perfect home God has prepared for us where there will be riches beyond anything we could imagine upon this earth, all laid up for us by Christ Jesus, our Savior. We stop trusting in ourselves. We trust in him because this promise has been sealed by the very blood of Jesus Christ. So seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and live. In Christ our Savior. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God which surpasses our understanding, guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We confess what God has done for us with believers around the world with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. If you're here in person, please sign a friendship card before you leave. We'll keep in touch with you about things going on at Emmanuel. If you're joining us online, please go to the description link and you can sign in there. You can leave an offering here at our church or support our church's work through our website. We continue now with the sermon hymn, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. Please stand for prayer. Just a quick note on the prayer of the church. We will be skipping the last petition that begins, Loving Father, according to the testaments of your only begotten Son. Uh, we are not celebrating the Lord's Supper today, so we'll skip that petition. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, and for all people according to their needs. Gracious Father, 
It is your gracious will that we sinners come to you in faith so that we may share in Christ. We thank you for the forgiveness we have in him and for the assurance that we are given that you hear and answer us for his sake. Lord, in your mercy, we share in Christ, our Savior and Redeemer. Lord of the church, you reveal yourself wherever your word is proclaimed in all the world. Grant that all souls burdened by sin and guilt find salvation in you, that we proclaim Christ to all those for whom he gave his life. Guide us here at Emmanuel and your people throughout the world. Lord, in your mercy, we share in Christ, the Lord of the nations. Your word, O Lord, commands us to pray for those in authority and in leadership over us. Bless this land in which we live. Grant that all those who govern us do so diligently. Grant that all those who enforce our laws do so wisely. Grant that all those who serve us do so wholeheartedly. Lord, in your mercy, we share in Christ, upon whose shoulders our government rests. Faithful healer of both soul and body, we lift up before you those who are suffering in any way, physically, mentally, relationally, and spiritually. Especially, we pray for the family of Margie Houston, whose sister passed away yesterday. Comfort them with the assurance of your gospel that all those who die in the Lord rise to receive a crown of righteousness. Grant that their hearts and minds be guarded in Christ Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, we share in Christ, our merciful and healing Lord. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated for our closing hymn. God's blessings to each of you, and may the words of his love fill your heart to overflowing, that we can share that with other people. Next week, as noted in the bulletin, we have our trunk or treat. We could use a few more helpers, uh, even if you don't want to decorate a trunk, if you'd just like to help with registration or help pound out some, some food, uh, please sign up and back if you could. That's be next week, Sunday. We hope to have a good uh, turnout, a good uh, impression upon our community. We also are in our adult Sunday school. We just started today a class about how we can all become more comfortable sharing Christ in our world that is changing in so many ways. We had an introductory lesson today, but I'd like to invite you, I hope, to maybe plan to join us in the weeks to come. We've got a little video to show you what the class is about.
When the first Lutheran immigrants came to this country from places like Germany and Norway, church was still very much at the center of culture. And this mindset continued well into the 20th century. When people would move into a new community, one of the first things they would look for was a church to attend. But that mindset has changed. Many, many people no longer think this way anymore. Our culture is increasingly being described with words like de-churched and secular and sometimes even post-Christian. So the way our culture thinks about religion has changed. If we want to reach out to this great mission field of our own culture which God has placed before us, if we want atheists and skeptics and the younger generations and people who are furthest from God to hear the story of Jesus' love, then that mission work is often not going to start at the church. It's going to start with you. Love motivates us to push past our fears, anxieties, and nervousness. None of us have it right, and none of us have it perfect, but Jesus fills that in for us. Because it's a different day when you have that comfort. We can be present, and we can be persistent. These next three lessons are an exploration of active listening. Do you ever think that God just might be using you to carry out His work, His timing, His purposes in changing lives? And this is what we do. This is our gift. You do not need to be locked up in the fear of the possibility of not having any answer at all. Peace be with you. So let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Jesus is sending you. We had a real nice discussion today with the introductory video. And again, I hope that you can join us. Adult Sunday School starts about 9.15 or so each Sunday. For the next uh, couple of months, we're going to go through different uh, lessons uh, talking about how we can do that and studying God's Word together to grow in our ability to share the love of Christ with this world that so desperately needs to hear about Him. God bless each of you as you live out your faith each day, and please be sure to greet the other people here as you leave this morning.